So one of the key things that, that is uh, important to me to, to um, communicate and convey today is how important it is to just open the discussion about um, intimacy and sex. It's something that um, in our culture and society we're not particularly good at talking about, particularly as people age. So there are lots of assumptions that are made about that um, and I think that's really important um, to sort of just put that out there right at the start, that we should, uh, it not should, but it's important that if people want to be able to talk about issues that they're able to raise them when and where they would like to. So um, just a disclaimer to start with, I'm not here to tell you that you must have sex or that you should be doing this. It's really, it's sex and intimacy are incredibly personal things and people go through different um, phases in life with, with um, how engaged they are with intimacy and with sexual relationships. Um, so it's not an essential requirement for life. Um, we're not trying to tell you that you really must um, must be engaging in these activities. Nobody's judging for this, and it's a, it's really an obligation, not a choice. So I just would like to put that out there um, right at the front, at, up front as well. Um, but if sex is something, uh, and intimacy, sorry, intimacy and sex are things that are important to you, and as a consequence of cancer and and treatment, that you're experiencing changes, then there are things that can be done to help with that. So I guess that's the other key part of the the message. Um, the other thing that I find really interesting having done some of these talks in various places is how uncomfortable health professionals and, um, and people are talking about this and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So I think it's really important also f um, to understand where people are coming from and their cultural context um, in which they're, they're operating. So to tell you a little bit about mine, um, I am uh, the result of a, a mixed ethnicity um, relationship and grew up in northwest New South Wales um, and moved to to, um, to Sydney, to the inner west, um, to go to university some 20 odd years ago, um, where I still live um, today with my um, my family. So I've been in a committed relationship with my partner for more than 20 years. We have two teenage children um, who are incredibly embarrassed about the fact that I'm here talking about sex. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's never a dull moment. So essentially that's really a little bit about me. Um, and I guess the, the other point of sort of talking about the inner west is that it's a very um, open and, and uh, have, have a lot of exposure to people from alternative lifestyles as well. Um, so on to the meat of what we're talking about. So what we'd like to cover today is really what sexuality is, um, some of the physical changes that can affect sex organs and response in people with um, ca after cancer and its treatment, um, and some of the emotional changes that can impact on that as well. Um, talk a little bit about the interventions that um, in can improve sexual well-being and introduce you to the trial that we're running at the moment, the Rekindle study. So sex, um, sexuality is not just sex, um, it's about who you are and um, how you see yourself. Uh, it's also about how you express yourself sexually and your sexual feelings for others and often it's an expression of intimacy um, and humans are all sexual beings and expressing that to different levels. One of the things that's really critical as I sort of um, pointed out right at the beginning is really that where we're sex and sexuality occurs in the context of um, a society with uh, ideas about gender and body image and societal expectations and all of those things can impact on um, people's sexuality. Um, just to give you the formal definitions that we follow here, it's sexual health and sexual dysfunction um, which are defined by the World Health Organization. So sexual health is really a state of physical, emotional, mental and social well-being that relates to sexuality. It's not merely the absence of disease or dysfunction or infirmity. So it's really emphasizing the health aspects of, um, of, of the, the situation. And dysfunction, it refers to the various ways in which an individual is unable to participate in sexual relationships as they might wish to. So what we um, are learning is that um, that, that um, in the past, um, people's experience of sex after cancer hasn't been discussed very much by lots of people. Um, we do know now from um, research that's been done that um, uh, across a range of cancers that people commonly report changes in the frequency with which they have sex, their satisfaction and their engagement in sexual activities um, can be significantly reduced after diagnosis and treatment. And that is not dependent on whether you've had a, what would be classified as a reproductive cancer, so prostate, breast, 
or gynecological cancers. Um, so it was really across all tumour groups that we see these changes. Some of the, perceive, the causes that um, cancer survivors have described um, that they perceive as causing um, these changes really are the physical consequences of cancer and its treatment. Some of the psychological factors, definitely body image has, um, concerns play a role, and then relationship factors, and all of those preceding things can, can um, impact on rela on the, into the relationship factors. So somewhere between 40 and 100% of survivors will experience some level of sexual dysfunction depending on the cancer site. Um, the difficulties are co sometimes complex with physical and psychological uh, concerns interacting. Um, for example, something people feeling anxious and that might exacerbate their pain, which makes it less um, likely or less, uh, less comfortable for them to engage in sexual activities. Um, it represents a major quality of life issue for some people. Um, and the changes um, to sexual function can persist long after the initial diagnosis and treatment, and we're starting to see more of that. But with an intervention, up to 70%, so a large majority of people can have some level of improved function. And I guess the really critical thing here is it's not necessarily going back to the life that you had before, but again, as, as often it uh, occurs after a diagnosis of cancer, that it's really a period of readjustment and things change. But it's different rather than worse or better. Um, the other thing that we've learned is that partners can also be affected by this. Um, in an Australian study that was done, um, uh, caregivers or partners of, of um, people who had had cancer reported changes in the frequency um, of intimacy and sex and to a large proportion of them. Um, and as patients' physical side effects increased, their partners reported a, a greater deterioration in the sexual activity, their satisfaction, as well as feelings of self-blame and sadness associated with that. And the changes were concerned with some of the physical impairments, um, also related to the partner's level of fatigue um, that might be associating with their caregiving activities, um, and also changes in the perceptions of sex with their partner. Um, and just to warn you that um, I, there will, I, I am going to sh show a, 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 an image from the SCAR project uh, um, that's been um, sort of done to raise awareness about uh, body image after, um, after different surgical interventions. So um, if you're a little bit squeamish, you might not want to, to, um, to take that on, so just a warning. Um, but certainly surgical removal of body parts um, has an impact on people's body image and their self-perceptions. Um, it's very common for women and men to feel less um, masculine or, um, or feminine, depending on um, where the sort of cancer that they've had, if it involves removal of, um, of secondary or primary sex organs. Their body image um, can evolve and it might take time. Reconstruction um, of... Um, so breast or other other parts might not um, restore sensation, which I think some people don't necessarily understand or may not be prepared for. And sometimes people can, um, that all relates to um, and feeds into having in increased difficulty becoming aroused. We also know that sex, um, emotional changes can affect people's sexual well-being and things like stress, changes to body image, fear and uncertainty, which is certainly an important component of living with a cancer diagnosis and beyond that, um, and anxiety and depression all feed into um, people's ability to or interest in sex and sexual activity. Um, some of the implications, the other implications really are that hormonal changes um, can affect people's sexual response, which can decrease their libido, they can become more distracted during sex because they're thinking about things, and really it leading to an avoidance of affection and sexual activity. So sometimes for people it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle where you, you don't want, you stop any kind of intimacy because you don't want to lead to um, you know, a sexual encounter that might be, may be uncomfortable or that you, you don't really want. Um, the other thing that's really important to know, this is really not just a problem after cancer, it's related to lots of chronic illnesses, and I think one of the things that's great about cancer is that we are starting to talk about this. Um, it's not necessarily so in other health conditions, so, um, and, and certainly what people are telling us as part of the Rekindle study is sometimes it's, you know, it's not their cancer experience, but it's their partner's health, um, health problems from other diseases that has really impacted on their sexual activity and their intimacy. Um, so it's certainly a problem that needs addressing more broadly in the community. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to sort of um, highlight is really the different, um, the, the human sexual response cycle and where a whole lot of things um, that relate to cancer and its treatment might impact um, on that, that response cycle. So certainly at the desire point, um, 
or you know sort of wanting thinking about wanting to have sex um altered gender perceptions um in terms of um, and body image changes can um can impact on um people's uh, response to to thoughts of sex um anxiety and depression as we've, as we've talked about already fatigue certainly feeds into that so if you're feeling tired you're not really interested in engaging in any intimate um, relationships hormonal imbalances um, changes in hair loss and things like that in the immediate um, treatment period and nausea um, sore mouth and, and diarrhea and things like that can all impact on on um, changes to to your response and what sometimes happens is that while those things some of those problems might be acute during treatment it sets up a pattern of behavior that's then difficult for people to change because you um, you start to sort of feel that that this is the the, the the gap between you and your partner might start to become wider and um, you don't then respond, um, you, you don't get back to normal necessarily afterwards without some additional help. And certainly in the arousal f- um, phase, anxiety, depression, hormonal imbalances and peripheral neuropathy, so nerve changes, um, and vaginal or penile, penile changes can also impact on, um, on how easy it is for people to become aroused. Um, anxiety and altered orgasm sensations or delayed orgasms can, um, or an inability to orgasm can uh, also um, be a result of uh, cancer and its treatment. Um, and people can sometimes have bleeding or pain and that leads, contributes to reduced sexual enjoyment overall. So you can kind of see there's not really anywhere on that pathway there's something related to um, cancer and its treatment is not having potentially having an impact for some people. So... How do we intervene with this? Um, One of the things that's really important um, is facilitating communication with um, your intimate partner or uh, sexual partner, treating underlying causes um, of of physical problems, physical or psychological or social problems where they exist, and minimising the effects of anatomical changes by using different um, aids that might help um, people achieve the the intimacy that they might want, as well as symptom uh, things that help with symptom relief and giving information and advice on alternative um, methods of intimacy. Uh, but, and wherever, where, where it's required, referring people to specialised services. Just a word about health professionals. Um, so what we find is, and as I mentioned earlier, that many people are not comfortable with talking about intimacy and sex, and that goes for the people who work in the caring professions as well. They may have their own difficult sexual and intimate relationships. Um, they're worried about talking to people about it sometimes. They don't have the answers, and that makes them feel particularly uncomfortable, and I would say that's very true of, um, of, many, of doctors. They really don't like to not have the answer. Um, and they also don't know where to necessarily know where to refer people for help. So that's part of not having the answers. So um, they have a tendency to not ask about things that they can't help with. Um, but having said that, it's not a reason for you, for you to not feel like you can't ask the questions. So I think that um, part of this process is, is us making increasing awareness about what services exist and making that um, clearer to health professionals as well as to people living with cancer and the consequences of it. So some of the things that I'm going to be talking to um, health professionals about this evening and tomorrow really are some strategies that might help them to talk more um, openly and effectively about uh, intimacy and sexual changes after cancer. So there are two models that I'm just going to quickly cover so you know what I'm telling health professionals as well. Um, The better model starts with encouraging people to bring up sexual function um, and explain to them that um, sexuality is part of quality of life and letting people know that they can talk about sex and intimacy with people in their treating team. Um, telling them that, telling patients that appropriate resources are available um, and that, that they can access to address some of their concerns. And addressing the issue of timing. So one of the tricky things about cancer and, and looking after people with, um, with chronic illnesses is getting the timing about when you tell people different pieces of information right. And this is probably a really critical one, um, particularly for intimacy and sex. So when you've just been diagnosed and you're making decisions about what treatments to have, oftentimes that's not the time when you're really thinking about uh, about intimacy and sex. And so really we want maybe letting you know that there are options to talk about this in the future at that time would be helpful. But then again, come, coming back to it um, over time as you advance through the treatment trajectory is probably a really useful way of doing things. Um, providing some information and education about what may happen as um, side effects um, that will impact 
potentially um, intimacy and sex as part of the treatment that they're on. And make a note that that's been discussed in, in, in um, patients' charts so that people know that, um, that it's a topic that has been touched on but might need to be revisited in the future. So they're the sorts of things that we'll be telling health professionals we would like them to be doing to be helpful um, to patients. The other thing is, um, is, is uh, the Plicit model, which is really... Um, was developed quite some time ago and it's really about giving permi people permission to talk about intimacy and sex, providing them some limited information, giving some specific suggestions about what might be helpful and giving access to intensive therapy where and when it's appropriate and needed. Um, it's really commonly uh, commonly used model of uh, communication about sexual issues and, and it's really started to be applied to, um, to sexuality in, in cancer particularly more recently. Um, and most people um, can be managed in terms of the, um, the sort of the f permission to talk about it and limited information will be helpful to most people at some point. Um, a smaller proportion of the population will need some additional specific suggestions, but most people will, will fit into that category. About 30% of people with cancer might need some more intensive um, advice and help um, in order to cope with their changes. So... Um, on to a little bit more about what helps um, now that I've told you the things that we know about the problems. Um, there are lots, of, there are different treatment options that I have some evidence to support them and we certainly know that vaginal moisturisers which are non-hormonal and over-the-counter products can be used, that, that when used regularly can improve um, vaginal health um, particularly in people who've had hormonal changes um, and, um, and that, that can be helpful. Personal lubricants used during sex can also be really useful um, to, to, um, to assist and um, also treat the use of vaginal dilators particularly for people who've had um, pelvic radiotherapy or, um, um, or who also have had other hormonal um, treatments that might cause um, vaginal changes. Um, and there's certainly things that um, have, uh, radiotherapy nurses are able to help with and um, in, in advising on how to use them. Um, and then the treatment options for male erectile dysfunction can include um, so the tablets like Viagra or Cialis, penile pumps or penile injections. Um, the other things that really are quite helpful are back to exercise. Um, so really Kegel exercises... Um, can help to manage, um, teach you more pelvic control that helps people relax the, relax the vagina before and, and during sex. And that can, um, can actually reduce um, the likelihood that women are feeling tense and therefore um, uh, helps to break that pain and, and that tension and pain cycle. Um, the, some of the pros about um, Kegel exercises really is that it does increase your pelvic floor um, strength. It helps to increase arousal some, for some people and um, gives people the ability to focus on um, the pleasure of sex and their partners can feel the, the vaginal movements as well. The other thing is men, do, men are not let off the, um, the Kegel exercises. They work for men. They can help strengthen their pelvic floor muscles as well. And that can help to improve their erection strength and the, length, and the longevity of their, their erections, as well as helping with bowel control. So we all need to be doing our Kegels, whether or not we've had cancer anyway. Um, some of the other options to avoid genital pain really are to plan sex at times when people feel less pain um, and taking you know, non-drowsy pain medications in advance um, so that, that could be um, any, any effort to minimise pain would be helpful. Focusing on feelings of excitement and connection, playful touching, um, non-coital sexual activities, which I think is a really important part of, um, of re-engaging with intimacy um, in this process, and using a, a sensate focus, so you know, really focusing on what it feels like to be touched in different ways. Um, and trying different positions that might be helpful to minimise pain and things like that. So some of the um, psychological interventions um, that we might use would really typically focus on intimacy and physical connections, and they may not necessarily um, relate to sexual intercourse, um, and then advice about how to, to use different treatments um, as part of the, the process, but in particular communication skills training um, in term, and support and talking to partners and, and healthcare providers about what your needs are. I think I can't, probably can't stress enough how much the communication is is a critical component of that and we'll come back to that a little bit later as well. 
Some of the barriers to uptake and retention of these sorts of interventions are really people not being aware of what's available. So if you, you don't know, you're not necessarily going to be um, told about these things either. Um, there's quite the, and there's a lack of referral to support services where they are available by health professionals. Um, and that's often caused by embarrassment both on the part of patients and providers. So as we were talking about earlier, really people don't raise things that they um, don't feel comfortable talking about. Um, it can sometimes be a lack of engagement between either, um, uh, either or both partners in a relationship. Um, and really, um, it, sometimes the attention to partners being quite fairly minimal, so people are not paying attention to the needs of you know, both parties in a relationship equally. Um, so what all of that did was sort of make us think about why are these things not being accessed and how could we improve this situation. So we did a little study which has helped us to develop the rekindle intervention. Um, what we wanted to know, um, what work, you know, how do we make what, what works or what we know works accessible to people who actually want to use it? So we did this study. And what we aimed to do was look at um, the preferred mode of psychosexual support and what the barriers to uptake of that amongst a, a sample of, um, of Australian people. We use breast cancer survivors because there's a register of breast cancer survivors that we can access relatively easily. So it's not that we're not interested in everybody. It's just that it's, this is a group of people we can, we can connect with in a relatively relatively easy way. So one of the in things that we found really quite fascinating about this is where people are finding or going to for information about sex and sexual well-being um, after a cancer diagnosis. So as you can see here, um, over a third of people were, going, were looking for advice via books or articles. Um, another third of people were looking for information on the internet. Um, hardly anyone was talking to their partner or seeking advice from their partner or spouse about, um, about sex. And a bit under a third were talking to their GP or their oncologist. And I guess we were a little, I was probably a little bit surprised that that was as high as it is. But it was also a relatively small sample. It's only just over 100, 100 women who had all had breast cancer. But interesting nonetheless. Um, what we asked them were what interventions um, they've used and how helpful um, they found them. Um, a reasonable proportion of, had used lubricants, um, a smaller proportion vibrators or topical creams. A pretty small bunch of people had, um, had used any sort of um, talking therapy. Um, and interestingly, not all of them found things very helpful. But about a quarter of the people who responded to the survey hadn't used any intervention at all for their intimacy and sexual changes, which we thought was really interesting. So we asked them as well um, if they were to receive support in the future to address some of their sexual concerns, what information would they, what topics would they be interested in? And you can see them sort of ranked here from um, most to least um, of interest. And they really wanted to know, wanted education about what medical treatments were available an education about the sexual side effects, so what, what they might expect to happen, and how um, cancer treatment can affect relationships and dating. And then also very high on the list were strategies to improve intimacy in terms of emotional, emotionally and physically with partners and, ha and communication. So it kept coming back to, to that, um, that question. So the preferred, we asked them also about what format they would prefer this information to be available in, and they certainly came out um, with online education programs as being one of the top priorities, or in the form of a book or a DVD. So that was one of the reasons that we um, took Rekindle online because that's what people were telling us they wanted. The least interesting to pe or least of interest were um, telephone support, face-to-face -face support groups, or online support. So really, what that was saying to us. Oh, hang on, I'll come back to that. Um, what that was saying to us is that people don't want to be having these discussions in public. They want, to be, um, the, they want it to be a, a private experience, um, which we also took on board. In terms of the features of an online psychosexual resource, um, what they really wanted was real cancer survivors, people who'd had an experience of cancer, 
um, talking about and sharing their experiences of sexual changes after treatment. They also wanted um, those written stories and things like that. They wanted it in an online format. Videos of health professionals explaining um, the educational material provided. And they also told us that they really wanted access to some animated videos on how to use medical devices to improve sexual functioning. So how do you, how do you actually use a vacuum pump or dilators and things like that? So we really did take a lot of, um, of that information on board in the development of Rekindle. But what was really key was that communication was, was key. It, it, it imp highlighted the importance of that communication and really identified a, a real need in the community for self-guided communication skills and training. Um, and so we also asked them to tell us about what, what made it difficult to talk about sex. And um, some of the things that came out through that survey really were changes in their relationship perceptions, um, identity conflicts, um, their, masculine, their perceptions of themselves as masculine or, or feminine people, um, and sexual self-efficacy self and, and confidence really were, were things that were concerning to people. So in summary from that, what we learnt was that future, any future intervention that we developed needed to be um, provided in a private way. People's preferences really were um, to offer support that was web-based um, and probably that both survivors and their partners would likely benefit from that. So that led us to develop the Rekindle study, um, which is running at the moment and is assessing the feasibility and acceptability of this resource to address sexual concerns among cancer survivors and their partners. Um, there are a large number of stakeholders um, who are involved in this, so we have a big team both in Australia and internationally um, taking part. We partner with the Cancer Council, um, specifically the Cancer Council in New South Wales, um, to deliver this, uh, uh, the, to deliver the study, and a number of um, different organisations in terms of funding as well. So Rekindle's translating what we know, um, the existing evidence-based um, interventions, into a self-led web-based intervention. And we came up with the content based on the information that people had told us, but um, by systematically looking at the literature um, on psychosexual interventions so that we, we looked at what does work and what there's evidence to support, educational materials that were available from the Cancer Council and other community-based organisations where a lot of effort has been put into developing resources, and then um, a series of ongoing studies where we were talking to cancer survivors about their experience and, and using that in a very real, informative way. We used a number of different theoretical frameworks that I won't really go through, but um, the web design um, in terms of the e-health intervention, the content of the program and the tailoring approach that we're using were all very much based in the, on the, the available evidence to support, um, to support that. So we think it's, it's pretty comprehensively developed and designed um, principles that underpin it. So the aims of the study um, really were... Um, to develop it as a personalised web-based psychoeducational resource to guide and support um, users' long-term um, learning and, their, their, and to address their sexual concerns um, for them and their partner, as well as to demonstrate its acceptability. Um, we also have a couple of different modalities of Rekindle that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a moment. And we were trying to determine which of those is optimal to use if we were to take this forward, particularly um, in future uh, in the community. If it looks like it works, then um, the Cancer Council will make that resource available as part of its programs. Um, and to provide some idea about how big a study we would need to do in order to, um, to demonstrate that it works. So the format of Rekindle is that it does involve case studies in video format. Um, it has a, lo a large component of skills training, lots of reflective exercises, and includes some self-assessments along the way. So it really is designed to be tailored and, and useful um, to, to people to use in, in small chunks. Um, and it's also tailored to the type of user, so whether you're a patient or um, a partner of a patient, um, the gender of a user... Uh, and their sexual orientation, um, as well as whether or not they're actually in a relationship or not. So the study design itself, which is probably um, the, the least interesting thing to many people, but people can register onto this, uh, on the, the website and um, they talk to us to sign up and then complete an online survey. At the time that you complete the online survey, you random, it's randomly allocated to one of three different groups. So we really want to know whether... 
the rekindle program is actually a lot better than, um, than the sort of standard information that you might find available. So we have an attention control group. People who get this um, receive written inf or information on a static website, which is similar to the content of rekindle, but without all of the video enhancement and the exercises and things like that. Um, in the Rekindle group, you work through the program um, without any further uh, contact or intervention with our research team. If you're in the Rekindle Plus, Plus group, you um, are contacted three times during the, the study uh, while you're doing the intervention by people from the Cancer Council helpline to see whether or not um, there are things that you might need additional help with and making sure that you, the website's working for you and, um, and all of those sorts of things. So this takes about 10 weeks to work through the program. Um, and then at the end of that time, people complete a second um, online survey, which will tell us whether anything's changed that might actually be a result of the, pro the interventions that you've been working through. Um, we also then do a telephone interview to try and get some more detailed information from different, different users about how this intervention was either helpful or not helpful, how we could improve it so we can continually update and improve the, the program as we go through. And then six months later, we ask people to fill out a third survey. The people um, in the control group, um, once they've finished the online survey, they will also get access to Rekindle. So it's not so much a matter of um, if you get allocated to the program, it's a matter of when you get to access it. So that's a, a really important thing to, for people to know. Um, Noni Hazelhurst is our front person for the, the intervention. So she does a lot of the narrating through the program. And this is really the, um, the page that people would see when they logged in after they'd registered. And you can see here that it's, um, you just see down the bottom here, this is our little pathway. Um, which will be different for each user. Um, the surveys are all done online and they're simple sort of tick boxes, which I'm not expecting you to read, but just to kind of give you an idea about what it would look like. Um, and then again, back to the pathway. So um, everyone starts with a foundations component, but then the the um, the next com next sections really would be dependent on your responses to um, to the questionnaire. So it really does match what you um, say your needs are to the information that you're given and the order in which that's delivered. Um, so we do have the component on listening skills. And I think the next one is just I wanted to, um, to show you this feedback that we'd received from one of the previous participants in Rekindle um, who sent this little note to us in the mail. And it really, this is the kind of thing that really makes it worthwhile and makes you feel like you're possibly on the right track with an intervention that might be useful for people. And I'll stop there with plenty of time for questions. So if you're interested in, um, in learning more about Rekindle, you can certainly um, access, access information about us via the web. So you can go onto the website and have a look around. Um, if it's a study that you might be interested in using, then you are more than welcome to sign up for that. Or follow us on Twitter where we provide information sometimes about different, um, different things related to, to cancer and in particular um, sexual ev evidence for new information about cancer and sex as it becomes available. Um, so yeah, I'll stop now. But I'm very happy to, to talk more if anyone has questions or comments. So just please join me in thanking um, Dr. Harriana Dillon for that great presentation. So thank you. We do have plenty of time for questions and we have got a roving mic. So if anyone does have a question you know, about the study or some of the uh, other information that we've heard today, please do feel free to. I know it's a, this is one of the issues that we have around talking about intimacy and sexuality. People like to do it anonymously, so we could all close our eyes perhaps when, that might when, work. <laughs> when someone's got a question to ask. But it is difficult, but if you know, we're here, carry on us here for any questions, especially around this week here. Yeah, We've sure. got a gentleman here. We'll just quickly get a mic to you because we are recording. It's not really a question. That's okay. Comments? We'll have comments yep. as yep. well. There was a good program yesterday on SBS. The age of people having sex, some up to, some up to the age of 90 odd. Mm -hmm. And it was very well presented. And I think it was on that late line show, that female that does the uh, interviewing with different people. I thought that was most interesting. Anyone else see that? 
In, inside, inside, that's right. Yeah. No, I didn't say it myself, but I think that's that's absolutely right. It's one of the things we have make all of these assumptions around um, when people, you know, when sex is important to people and relationships are important, and and that's something that would be really, you know, busting some of those myths is a really important comp part of communicating about this. I think absolutely right. Yeah. Well, good things. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing I forgot to mention. Um, the Cancer Council New South Wales um, uh, survivorship group um, recently ran a webinar on um, men and cancer, and that was it was really fascinating. We had um, three panelists, um, who, one of whom was a testicular cancer survivor, um, who's written quite a lot of books and, and done a lot of media around that um, uh, since his diagnosis and treatment. Uh, a, a, an epidemiologist who had recently done some work around prostate cancer and, um, and sexual out health outcomes, and, and then a, a GP who does a, uh, also works um, with a focus on sex therapy in Sydney. And they had one of the most um, engaging and um, interesting discussions, particularly about men and sexuality, that, that I've ever listened to. So that will actually be available online um, in the next few weeks. Um, so I'd really commend that to you as something to, to go ahead and have a listen to. It was a really interesting discussion about... Um, how we make assumptions about men as they age and and forget that you know men who are aging now and, and in, you know get and being diagnosed with cancer are, are the baby boomers and they've had a very different life than we might have expected for someone that lived in the the 20s or 30s um, so I think it's it's it was a really nice description of why we need to to start challenging our assumptions around around this sort of thing Just get you to wait for the microphone because we are recording it. It's helpful for our listeners. <laughs> so I guess from a um, health professional perspective, um, I think the point that you raised about that was really good, especially a lot of the, for us who are budding health professionals, um, myself and Ari here, um, who are students at the moment, it can be hard to deal with that human perspective and that human component of it. I guess... In the future, do you foresee like a landscape where the best practice is for each health professional, whether that's pharmacist or physio or whatever your specific area is, to be able to address issues with um, sexuality within their field? Or is there more a role of a very specific health provider to deal with that and be comprehensive all at once? Mm -hmm. oh, thanks for that question. It's a really good one. And I think really... Um, I think it's probably, the short answer is it's probably both. Um, so I think there is a need for specialist um, intervention and, and, and health professionals who are specifically working as, as sex therapists um, who can help with very complex sexual challenges. But what we're learning from people really is that, by and large, most people need information. They need the confidence and the skills to be able to communicate with each one another about their intimacy and their sexual needs. And that's really something that almost every health professional could give support on and advice about. And I think that's probably... It probably isn't just for sex either. I think it's across the board in terms of changes and adjusting to cancer or other chronic illnesses even, that you, these are the sorts of things that you might want to be talking to um, you know, friends, family and, and other people about. And here are some strategies that might be helpful for you to do that. Here's some information about these particular side effects, some of, them, some of which might be um, intimacy and sex related, but they can relate to a whole range of other things. Um, and at the moment, I don't think we're doing necessarily a particularly good job across the board of, of providing that information to people. Um, there needs to be a lot more focus on communication in training programs for health professionals as they come through. And I think also supporting those um, training, you know, those specialist um, skills um, in people as they pr progress through the, the profession as well. So it's not the kind of thing that you just you learn once and, and never have reinforced. It's something that you can continuously improve. And I th think some of the move to in health professional education for these things to be done online has actually diminished the quality of the outcomes um, in that kind of training. So experiential learning where you actually get to try out how you would say things to people is actually really, really important. Uh, 
It's just raised a question that I'd like to ask. Oh, shall I, we'll, we'll let this fellow ask it. Maybe it's my question. <laughs> Thanks. Lucky last. Do, do you know, as far as prostate cancer goes, and people who have had intervention with that, how many people, what percentage of the guys get back to, to normal? Oh, it's a really, that's a really tricky question because it, it depends on so many different things. Um, so the biggest predictor of how effective, uh, also how um, a man's sexual function after prostate cancer really depends on his sexual function before he, he has cancer um, and has any treatment. Um, so, and, and some of those things really are related to age, um, weight in particular, and fitness. So those sorts of, the, all of those things impact. So... Um, and then again, the, the kind of treatment you, that people have. Um, I guess off the top of my head, I can't. I wouldn't want to give you a figure because I, I'm not. I don't think it'll be accurate. Um, but the key thing really is that the sooner um, men who've had prostate cancer start to intervene, um, or you know, start to, to try and actively. Um, in re-engage in sexual activity, that can actually be a, a good predictor of, of um, as well, you know, sort of waiting to the 12-month mark, which is what we find lots of people do. Um, they have their treatment, then they're sort of recovering and they don't really start to think about things. And then by sort of 12 to 18 months down the track, it's really had a big impact. Starting to, they're starting to feel the impact of, of not having, you know, that intimate relationship as, um, as easily as they did before. And that's when, you know, sometimes it might be, it's harder to then achieve a, the outcome that people would want. But interestingly, we had um, uh, some media coverage in the um, Australian Financial Review just last week um, with one of our Rekindle participants who was a prostate cancer survivor. Um, and he was talking about um, his sorts of feelings of, you know, he was becoming quite depressed and demoralised about, you know, the, the sort of loss of potency and loss of masculinity as part of his prostate cancer. And he found Rekindle really quite a transformative um, experience because it changed his perception of his sexuality as well. So I think that's the other thing that's really important is understanding about um, male sexual response. So at the moment we have this really big focus and uh, really on erections and and coitus and and then you know as being an ejaculation as being sort of how how men have sex and and that that being the only way that they can enjoy sex and that's actually not true so it's possible to to achieve orgasms without um you know without ejaculation and that that kind of thing so i think that's you know educating people about the options in in those sorts of terms actually make that uh, a much um, richer potential experience for people My question mm -hmm. is, when appointments are so short with your specialist or your GP, how can you talk about something that's difficult to raise anyway and you might be anxious about even raising it? How, have you got any advice for when you want to try and have that conversation mm -hmm. with your specialist or doctor? Yeah. I, I think one of the key things is um, probably is, is trying to have the discussion with the person that you trust the most. Um, because they're, they're the people that are most likely to, to be um, helpful in that particular situation. The other thing that I think is really important when, you, when you're in that situation and you potentially do feel anxious about raising a topic is, is really literally the simple write the questions down and take them in and say, you know, up front, I, there's something that I want to talk to you about and I find it really, you know, I, I might find it challenging to raise this topic but this is what it is um, and I think the other thing to help health professionals is also to say I don't necessarily expect that you will be able to tell me exactly what to do now that you have all the answers but what I'd like to do is explore with you what the options for support are and that might also make them feel a little bit less anxious about the, the, the you know having to talk about a topic that they're not necessarily comfortable with as well. Uh, I just want to um, make a point rather than a question. It's just wondering whether in the society spend a lot, I mean, put too much emphasis of physical interaction in partners equates the intimacy. So i just wondering if, when we talk about intimacy, is it apart from sex? I think perhaps there's some, it should be a little bit more emphasis on 
intellectual or even feelings with partners, and that is more than just the physical intimacy, particularly when people are not well. So uh, is it part of the research and studies, and how do we increasingly partners have this feelings for each other apart from the physical mm -hmm. side of it? Yeah, no, it's a great point because I think that is very true that we do have a tendency to focus on the physical outcome of, of sex and, you know, everybody achieving orgasm and all of those things, which we know doesn't happen all the time every day for, for most people. Um, but what um, both caregivers and patients tell us that they, they miss is the, the feeling of intimacy, the feeling of being connected with someone else. Um, and one of the drivers for that can, for the, the, the distance between um, intimate partners really is the, the fear around not not feeling confident about touching because of where it might go um, and you know the, the obligations to to sort of engage in in sex but I think that's a really important part of you know connecting with connecting people and allowing them to um, to be supported in that way and I think that that's why communication is such a key part of what we're we're doing because it really is hopefully designed to increase the connection and and the the, re, the strength of the relationship between people. <laughs> yeah, just a, a comment. Um, I found it very hard to talk to my partner about certain things, and so I used to write letters, <laughs> um, which I think is an underutilised resource, um, partly because. I'm a shy person, which is very strange to say about your partner, but also when you're on anti... I've had prostate cancer, mm -hmm. being on anti-hormone treatment, you can't think straight. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you write something down or you type it out, you can edit it and read it over and get it to say what you really want to say. Whereas if you're actually talking, I mean, you know, you can either write it out and then read it or just write the letter, have the person read it and then... <laughs> give you some feedback so yeah I think that's an absolutely fantastic suggestion you're right we don't use that kind of um, you know writing interaction um, probably enough and it's really I think really a very powerful way of clarifying your message and 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 what what you want to say to somebody um, and it also gives you a reference point to, to sort of always you know or, also come back to um, and you know to be honest with my two teenage kids I use it a lot because it means that we don't argue if I just write down what I you know the series of things that need to happen today it's fantastic <laughs> can really you know make that a much more um, useful interaction with with less emotion embedded in it I guess mm, thank you go ahead hello I'm a bit of an egg beater because I thought I was just coming to a rekindle the spark not the whole box and dice <laughs> and I can tell you when the, the spark went for me it was three weeks into radiotherapy because it just did and because of the treatment and the drugs you're out with the pixies and you're, you're just not yourself and that's what I was hoping to get from you is how you cope with feeling like you're the, your death warmed up and you're not a good friend, you're not a good wife you're not a good this, you're not a good that and just coping yeah, I think it, it's a really hard, um, challenging time. And I think all of those things can come together um, to make you feel like you're not coping. And I guess the thing that, that I often... And it, I hear it in lots of different things. So the, a lot of the work I do is also in chemo, you know, chemo brain and things like that. Um, and the thing I find most powerful for lots of people is giving themselves permission and a time to feel like they don't have to be on the top of their game. Um, and that sometimes that's enough to take the pressure off um, to allow you to think about what it is that you need or want or what it is that might actually be helpful in the next step to sort of help with um, get, through, get through that immediate problem and then start to, to recover to some level. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you so much all for coming. Just, just before everybody leaves, just, you know, thank you very much. That really was informative. And I do hope many of you have the chance to go online. If you don't have internet at home, obviously, public libraries have fantastic internet connections. So uh, maybe, maybe looking into the Rekindle website is something that you really are interested in. And I hope that you take that opportunity now you've heard a, a bit more about it, that uh, you can explore that personally and anonymously online. So thank you very much for letting us know that, that has, uh, that's out there. It looked like t the days were numbered, though, nine weeks and five days left of the trial. Was that what oh, I no, saw no, on the bottom? No, sorry, no, that's actually just um, when we did the screen. Sorry, when we did the screenshots for that um, for that particular um, pathway, that's how long that kind of character had to go. So no, the, the study will be is open and recruiting, and we expect to be continuing probably through until about the middle of next year. Um, and hopefully um, after that we will know whether or not rekindle is something that is effective and if it is then it would be part become part of the cancer council's suite of programs that's great news that's really fantastic so finally please just complete the evaluation form if you haven't had a chance and also i'm not sure sure if you would have noticed but we have a lecture at the same time next week on a thursday uh, called could could my work cause cancer? So it's really looking closely at occupational cancers and exposures in our workplace that can increase the risk of cancer. And some of them are known to cause cancer. So that will be with Professor Tim Driscoll, who's expert in that area. So please do feel free to join us again next week if you'd like to. But uh, thank you very much for coming today.